Thanks for coming out. Uh, my name is Greg Sanders. I'm a tech writer here at Google, and I'm also a fiction writer. Um, and it's my privilege to introduce Jennifer Egan. She is the author of Invisible Circus, which was released as a feature film by Fine Line in 2001, and is now on my queue, by the way. Um, Emerald City and Other Stories, Look at Me, which was nominated for the National Book Award in 2001, and the best-selling The Keep. Her new book, which we'll be discussing today, is A Visit from the Goon Squad. It's a national bestseller won the 2011 National Book Critics Circle Award for Fiction and the Pulitzer Prize. Also a journalist, she writes frequently in the New York Times Magazine. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming out. Um, do you want to sort of briefly describe Goon Squad if you haven't had to do it a hundred times already? Actually, I've gotten slightly better at it because of that. Um, it's actually a very hard book to describe, which is one thing that I really worried about as I was working on it. It always helps if something is just easily characterizable in a sentence or two. But this, in fact, um, consists of 13 chapters that are very different from each other in mood and tone and feel. And in fact, each one has a different protagonist. And yet they all combine into one story. That And some of the issues braided through it are time and the music industry. It basically follows two main characters, a music producer named Benny Salazar and his one-time assistant named Sasha. And it goes backward and forward through their lives and actually also visiting peripheral characters' lives over a span of about 50 years. Um, I, think, I feel like the thing that I can say that seems to bring it most into focus for people is that um, structurally my model really was like the 70s concept album, something like Tommy or Quadrophenia where each piece sounds different and the fun of it is having all of these different sounding pieces collide together into one story. That's what I was going for. I think it works really well and there are stylistic differences also. I mean there's I think there's one chapter where there are no quotation marks if I if I remember correctly there are these little tweaks. Um, but one thing I notice is that you use there, there are two very solid anchors. Uh, you anchor each chapter either with music and or technology and time and uh, I think that I'm just wondering if you sort of came upon this method organically or if you thought like, I mean, even in the future sections, there's, you're sort of, you're not quite sure where you are and then you're like, oh, okay, this is definitely, this is definitely not now, but it sounds like a continuation of, of Twitter, of Facebook and whatnot. And then the past sections, there's kind of this, um, there's even uh, one of the characters I think says, oh, wait, you just wait until, you just wait until the future, we'll be able to find our, we'll be able to find all of our lost friends. I thought, I found that really interesting. Um, I'm just wondering if you, consciously did that? You know, it's, it's yes and no. My writing process is extremely organic. I write by hand on yellow legal pads. I have handwriting that cannot be read, often even by me, much less anyone else, which results in my basically not knowing what I'm writing as I write it. And I kind of like that. You know, as a journalist, I write on a computer, and I'm looking at what I'm writing and sort of revising it as I go. But as a fiction writer, I'm, I'm looking for the unconscious to do right. what I'm not able to do, <laughs> not smart enough to do. Um, so I basically, I follow the story and kind of wait for it to unfold in this handwritten way. And then when I have a draft, I type it up. And then I'm very systematic and analytical in trying to figure out what needs to be done with it, what it seems like it could be, and how to make it be more of that. And so in that phase, yes, I do a lot of thinking about thematic threads and how they're moving through and locating people in time and space. But the, the basic impulse is really a gut impulse. So and that's sort of the second editorial layer is kind of is putting the rivets in, in a sense. I mean, it's a counterpoint, because right. then when I execute those changes, I'm again doing it by hand on hard copies. So I write right. in my changes, which often involves the, you know, lots of strange arabesques and you know, symbols and arrows leading onto other pages, and then I have to type all that in. So at that point, I've again, I've veered very much back into kind of impulse and instinct. But then, ultimately, when I have another big draft, I read it through and make another very systematic outline. So it seems like a, a very kind of left brain, right brain. Uh, well, that might be good, that battle. That battle between the two is probably well, what brings I in some ideas. I don't see it as a battle. No, yeah. uh, it's, it's, sometimes the it is a battle. <laughs> like, why can't you get that done? Um, but yes, it is more of a, um, it, it feels like two sides of a process that both must be done well for it to work. Right. And the, the handwriting, uh, handwritten early drafts, does that kind of slow down process help you creatively? Um, well, it definitely slows me down. Um, I keep thinking, isn't there a way to speed this up? Um, I think it does help me. I think that the, it helps me in a number of ways. One is, as I said, you know, I'm trying to access the unconscious. 
And I can't seem to do that when I'm looking at what I write in a typeface. Now, people right. have pointed out that I could always cover the screen of a computer and write by hand. But I actually, I have to admit, I haven't tried that. But I don't really think it would work. I think there is something about the actual physical connection to the language that helps me. Um, and leads to surprises that I can't consciously think of, and I'm trying to enable that process. I also, you know, I have wrestled with the fact that I feel like it takes me too long to write books, and I have often thought, but if I could do it on a computer, it would be faster. But I've actually started to feel that I think I want time to pass as I'm writing yeah, books. Yeah, I mean, I, I, think it's, I think it's a good thing, actually. I mean, uh, for example, I use a manual typewriter. I type a lot of these up, um, and I find that there's a sort of a more forceful relationship with the language on the page when you're when you're physically doing it as opposed to I mean you can type really quickly obviously on a computer but you know I wonder sort of rhetorically how does it change my relationship with the content that I'm writing it's interesting um, though you know but Gabriel Garcia Marquez got on a word processor and never looked back so right. it's interesting how it, it works differently for each writer and so much of the challenge for me and I think really for everyone is just finding out what works for you and you do that by trial and error um, I do occasionally edit on a screen if I'm really stuck and I feel like I'm just, I, I'm, I don't know what I'm trying to do and I want to move it forward a step and I don't want to sit there not knowing what to do right. and doing it slowly. I figure if I don't know what I'm do, doing and I'm just going to flail, let's do it faster. That's the only time. But generally I find as I'm typing in changes, I'm thinking of this right now because I'm doing it today. I have a manuscript, I've made a bunch of edits, I'm bringing it to my writing group tonight. And so I have to type in all these edits. And as I'm doing it, I find myself you know, thinking, wait a minute, wouldn't it be better this way? I'm wanting to edit on the screen. But I really try to resist that temptation because generally those changes are wrong. And once I see it on the That's page again, I have to change them back. And I think, why did I do that? But you know, as we move into a world of reading more on screens, it leads to the question of how much it matters how it looks on well, the page. So I was actually going to ask that. That was one of my questions: is how do you think it's sort of uh, we've become so enmeshed in our relationship with our devices and technology and and um, you know paperless books? How do you think that affects? That's going to affect narrative forms like the novel, um, and should it affect the way a writer thinks about his or her readers? I don't, I, the answer is I truly don't know. I mean, it's clearly affected me to some degree, and I say that, I mean, I've, I've written a chapter that in a form that's really meant to be viewed digitally, so obviously I've been impacted by the notion of right, digital we'll reading. Right, we'll get to that, we'll get to that, yeah. Like but that. I've never used an e-reader, and in fact, I, I only have had a smartphone for two days, so I'm pretty behind. <laughs> we won't ask, we won't ask, you know what. Don't I'm ask doing. how well I'm texting on it, that's what's really sad, speaking of taking a long time. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I have a complicated relationship to technology, as I think we all do. Um, I'm sort of afraid of it. I, I mean, in a simple way, like, oh my god, maybe I won't know how to use it. Afraid of the implications of it in a bigger way. You know, I think there's always the fear that it will somehow make the world worse. And, you know, if you look yeah. at early reactions to the telephone, it was exactly the same. And you guys probably know more about all this than I do. But I think we still kind of feel it. It's the sense of hurtling forward, you know, where will that lead us? Things change so fast, you know. I had this sense, I taught at NYU um, the spring before this last spring, and uh, it, I taught undergrads, and one reason I wanted to do it was I thought, I want to know what young people are just sort of doing and thinking about right now. Often my journalism keeps me up to date with that, but I felt a little confused about it in terms of technology. But the thing that was so funny was these 20, 20 and 21 year olds felt old because they hmm. felt like, well, you know, teenagers now have really grown up with Facebook, but we didn't, so we're kind of the dinosaurs. And I thought, wow, I wonder if technology is moving so fast that everyone feels old. And, and you so can't, and you can't keep up. I find myself commiserating with 21-year-olds about how 14-year-olds were way ahead of all of us. And I thought, maybe the 14-year-olds are looking at the two-year-olds thinking, well, they know how to use right. iPhones. They've, they've grown up with them, and huh, I didn't have that experience. So and, who knows? <laughs> yeah, I mean, and speaking about two-year-olds and technology, the, there's the, the latter part of your novel goes is, it projects us forward, I don't know, 10, 15 years? I'm not sure. Yeah, um, something like that. And, the, the, and there is a sort of foreboding relationship with, with technology. I mean, there's sort of two threads or two elements. One is there's this kind of um, people are kind of uh, act as ads. I mean, they're paid to do the equivalent of like um, tweet and update their posts and whatnot to sort of create um, excitement about an event that's going to happen. Right. Um, 
And I found that really, really interesting. So you're saying you have a sort of troubled relationship, but, but you also but sort I'm of seem to use that. Yeah. And then there's also a section where there's this young couple that we meet earlier, much earlier in the novel, and then we see them in the future and they have a, I don't know, a two-year-old daughter, maybe she's a little younger, and, they, yeah. and there's this sort of, everyone's got this sort of, there's this ubiquitous communications texting device that everyone has, and they're like, they don't want her to touch it. Right, you know. and there's also been one invented for kids, although right, when exactly. I yeah. called a starfish, but when I imagined that, it was pre-iPhone, and in a way, I feel like that fantasy is already obsolete, because the iPhone is kind of what I imagined. Right. <laughs> Something really bright and candy-like that would be really easy, it would have a touch screen, yeah. and would be really fun and easy for kids to use and buy stuff on. I mean, I have a two-day smartphone user, and my children have already bought apps on it. I mean, they're not two, but, you know, so yeah. that in a way, I feel like that's already been kind of superseded. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that, ex you know, in that chapter, one feels some anxiety about technology. Um, at the same time, creatively, it is so exciting to me. Yeah. I mean, it's just thrilling to think about new forms and genres that become possible through technology, and, and to me, the novel, while many people feel that it's imperiled by all this, I don't actually feel that way, because to me, the novel has always been a very flexible, elastic, open um, form. You know, if you look at the earliest fiction, Cervantes and Lawrence Stern, you know, th that stuff is out there. It's meta. I'm reading Don Quixote now. It's unbelievable. Tristram yeah. Shandy has yeah. crazy graphics in there. I mean, yeah. if PowerPoint had existed, he would have been using yeah. it. You know, so I feel like there, there's all, there are all kinds of things that are possible, and, and that is really exciting to me, even as, you know, I myself am clearly not an early adopter. Well, I think in some ways you are. I mean, I, I mean, you're you're pushing the envelope. I mean, especially can we talk about one of the chapters in here sure. that I really that I really love? Um, for those of you that have the book, well, it starts on two thirty something. Um, but it's basically it's it's sort of I guess also a projection into the future, and it's this it's an entire chapter. The entire narrative is done. You said with PowerPoint. Yeah, I did um, it with PowerPoint. And uh, it could have been any slide. Could have been right, exactly, and and. Uh, Narrated basically by a young woman, um, a twelve-year-old, twelve-year-old, and she's in, and she's writing about her her um, autistic brother or or he's sort of he's, he has a kind of as, he's Asperger, a right. kind of Asperger. He clearly has trouble with socialization. Has kind of Asperger's obsession with the pauses and pauses rock and, and roll. Pauses and rock songs. and roll. It's called it's called uh, great rock and roll pauses. And it, I thought it was really great. And the thing is, there's narrative momentum in it, and there's no it's not standard. You know, obviously words on page. And I'm just wondering. Um, I actually saw an interview with you, I think it was on PBS, and you mentioned that you handed this chapter in after, to the publisher after the initial manuscript? Yeah, the book was sold, and there, this chapter wasn't in it. I had, tr I had been obsessed with working in PowerPoint, and in a way, that obsession, I think, epitomizes my odd relationship to technology, because I really wanted to write a chapter in PowerPoint, but I had never used PowerPoint. I wasn't even totally sure what it was. Um, and I didn't have, I, I said to some friends in corporate world, you know, send me, if, I want to learn more about what you do. Send me a few PowerPoints. Um, and then I discovered I couldn't open them because I actually didn't own PowerPoint. Right. Um, and then when I looked into it further, it, I determined that I actually didn't have enough memory on my laptop to hold it. And it was kind of expensive. So I thought, you know what, to hell with it. I write by hand, so I'm going to do PowerPoint by hand. So I sat down and drew rectangles on my yellow legal pad and thought, all right, let's get some PowerPoint happening here. Of course, it went nowhere. I mean, if you're going to work in a genre, you have to sort of be <laughs> in the genre. Um, so ultimately, I bit the bullet and bought the program and did all this. But even when I had done that, and I was struggling to figure out not so much how to use it, because it's easy, but what, what it meant to work in it. Because initially, I thought, OK, it's just bullet points. But in fact, that's not a very sophisticated use of PowerPoint at all. Um, and, but my biggest problem and the biggest hindrance and the reason I hadn't gotten far with it and sold the book without it was that I didn't like the corporate feeling of it. There was just this kind of corporate smell to it that yeah. seemed really unappealing and kind of antithetical to the feeling I look for in fiction. And so I couldn't figure out a way around that. So I thought, okay, you know what, I, I can't make this work. So I sold the book and then after that, there were a couple of things that were really nagging at me. The main one was that Sasha, one of the major characters, um, we, I was not able to find a way to visit her in her future life, whereas Benny, the other one, appears in the chapter we were just talking about. And that seemed really asymmetrical and wrong. 
and you know, so I, that was sort of nagging at me. And then there was the fact that I hadn't found a way to use the PowerPoint, and and a third obsession that I hadn't found a way to work in, which was an obsession with the pauses in rock and roll songs. And then all of a sudden, I had this kind of brainwave that if a kid was the PowerPoint narrator, it would undermine the corporate feeling. It just kind of couldn't be there, really, in a kid's voice. Um, and that if it was one of Sasha's kids, I would have found a way to, to visit her in her future. And then, as it turned out, I even managed to get the rock and roll pauses in there. Yeah, it's really... It's, um, because yeah. she's writing mostly about the tension in her family life resulting from her brother's obsession with these pauses and her father's absolute you know, not rage, but deep frustration at being lectured at about pauses in rock and roll songs endlessly by his son, thus being reminded of his son's trouble and, you know, difficulty socializing with other kids. Um, and so it, there's all this, I mean, it's a, it's a loving family, but, a, but you know, a family with, with issues and struggles like every family. And this 12-year-old is its chronicler, and she uses PowerPoint. So, yeah, she takes a, she's taking a course in, sli in making slides. I mean, she has, I think she quotes something from her class, add a graphic, get more traffic, right? I mean, that yes. sounds like something you'd hear, hear you know. Word wa uh, a word wall is a long haul. That's yeah, one. exactly. A word wall is a long haul. I should have gone into haul. advertising. Um, yeah. Yeah, um, no, it's clear that she's, you know, learned this at school. I mean, I think So these fact, kids are going to be basically, you know, in this version of the future, these kids are just completely conversant. In, in graphical representations of information. Well, I think oh, that's really somewhat true already. Yeah. In fact, I, it was funny because I thought, oh, this is a crazy idea that a 12-year-old would be using PowerPoint. Um, people are going to just die at the thought of that. And so I mentioned it to a friend of mine, and she said, Jenny, my 12-year-old just did a presentation in, in school in PowerPoint last week. I mean, this has already happened. And I said, oh, OK. I won't get credit for futurism on that one. Um, but but yes, you know she's you know this she keeps her journal in slides and this makes right. her mother very uncomfortable. Sasha, my main character, because she keeps saying, you know, why aren't you writing? What's all that white space? You know, where does the writing come in? So it becomes a you know an object of mother daughter tension too. Yeah, there's a lot going on in that chapter. It's it's I thought it was it was really great. Um, and I understand sort of tying into that. Um, I've also heard you say you don't write about your own life, but it sounds like. Um, you write about maybe little, there are little overlaps. You, you allow characters to sort of carry around your, your interests, your obsessions. I mean, the rock and roll pauses you said was actually yours. That's actually something that's been on your mind. Is that right? Yeah, you know, I think I do that a lot, actually. I think I have ideas that are interesting, but not all that interesting. Um, not interesting enough to do much with on their own. And instead of pursuing them myself, thank God, I just give them to give characters. Them to character. <laughs> where, when yeah, that they, makes sense. I, think they, I hope they become slightly more interesting. There's another one that sneaked in there. There's an art historian who wants to write a book about, about representations of sound in Cezanne's paintings, whether his brush strokes of his outdoor kind of green and orange landscapes are actually trying to suggest the sound of locusts at that time of year. And I had this thought myself, and I thought, oh, that's an amazing idea. Maybe I should pursue it. And then I thought, I don't know, it immediately translated into, wouldn't it be interesting if someone else was right, interested in that? Right, it provides that, that character with a, with a sort of quirky richness. So thank God I didn't take a two-year detour trying to somehow turn this into an art historical <laughs> thesis. It's not too late, though, you know. I think it's too late. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, I do that all the time. I have ideas that I, I flirt with ideas that I think are interesting, and then I give them to characters. I think that's the right home for most of them. Yeah, I think it works. And uh, one other one I noticed that also is a segue into my, one of the other threads is sort of the technology thread, that's the anchor, and then there's the music anchor, mostly punk. I mean, Benny Salazar is sort of an ex-punk rocker, and, and we meet some of his friends along the timeline, um, the past and, and the future. And he's got this great internal monologue. I think he's driving down, driving down the West Side Highway listening to the Dead Kennedys. And he's basically saying, like, I know why, I know why punk died. I know why music died. Because it's, it's digital music production. It's the sort of like, there's no longer hiss. There's no longer imperfections or, or, or pops. Um, and I was wondering if that was something, if that was, it's sort of a, a sensibility. I, I mean, I kind of think that's kind of, there's, there's something about digital processing that removes the edges. You know, I, that actually was not my idea. I read a piece by Neil Young and Harper's years ago. It had to have been, I don't, it was actually just as CDs were becoming ubiquitous. And he was decrying uh, this digital sound and saying that he thought it would basically kill music. 
And he, mm. his point was, you know, we'll, we'll somehow recover from this, but it's going to be really hard. And that always really struck me because I thought it was fantastic. You know, everyone was so excited about the clarity of the sound. Right, right. And he, that was exactly the thing that he abhorred and, and thought was in a way unmusical and sort of inhuman. Um, and so that, that idea stayed with me. And I think I sort of gave that idea to Benny. Gave that to Benny. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you think that there is sort of uh, a punk sensibility to the to the novel? I mean, this is sort of it's sort of it's a, it's slightly the, it, it's nonlinear, it's it's uh, it's slightly disruptive as far as the narrative form goes. And I, I kind of interpreted that. It might just be me, but I sort of interpreted. I was like, yeah, this is kind of a punk, punkish. You know, I didn't think so. I mean, I certainly thought of it as an album, as I said, and it's been pointed out to me since that my. PowerPoint chapter, which is the second to last, basically functions as a kind of musical pause in the book because it happens right. right at that point that I think pauses are best used. When you're close to the end of the song, the pause makes you think the song will end and then it doesn't. So there's this kind of rush of relief followed by a kind of sadness because then the song does end. It sort of, it, it heightens awareness of the song passing or of time passing. Um, so I, I, I think there was a musical idea behind the construction. Punk rock sensibility, I don't know. I mean, I, I think one thing that I didn't understand actually was how permeated the book is by music. I, in a way, I, I, I mean, I, I was interested in it and I certainly did research on it and I, I knew that my characters were in that industry, but for example, when the book first came out, we didn't really reach out to the music world at all in terms of publicity, which I think was sort of odd in retrospect. Mm. Eventually that world kind of found it on its own, but months later, um, so I think I, I didn't think of it as a rock and roll novel, and I think that helped me because that, you know, in a way, there are a lot of interesting books in that genre, and you know, High Fidelity and others. Right. And I think I might have been intimidated, just as I didn't think in the last chapter or the two last chapters, Leaping into the Future, I am writing science fiction, another genre I'm not that familiar with, and would be kind of, in a way, tentative about venturing into. So I, I didn't, I didn't focus on that too much. I, I guess the answer is I don't know. Yeah, I don't I mean, know. I, I also I, think it's maybe not a completely fair question because readers are going to bring their own nostalgia into it. That's it. it. And, you know, I was, I saw the Ramones in 81 at the Palladium, you know, I saw them a couple of times and I was, it was exciting, it was terrifying and I was kind of like, so I could identify even though your early punk scenes, I guess late 70s, early 80s took place in San Francisco and I was in New York, I was like there, yeah. you know, but of course I was bringing all of my own material into it. So then I was like, oh yeah. It's kind of a punk novel, you know? So. You know yeah. what I think? I think there's a desire out there for a punk novel. Yeah. <laughs> and I think people have been willing to consider this, you know, that and to fulfill that desire. And I feel lucky to have, you know, somehow tapped into a, a kind of collective musical wish. Well, yeah. um, it wasn't, I didn't think it myself, but I was very excited to write about that moment in, in the late 70s, that punk rock moment, which I you know, witnessed very much from ask, the were sidelines. You there? Were you, oh, from the sidelines, but you still witnessed it. You yeah, I was definitely circle. there. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, I didn't have green hair. I, right. I looked, right. you know, like me, but I was, I think I just felt the strangeness and the newness of it. And I think it was especially vivid because this was all happening in San Francisco where I and all of my friends had grown up in the 70s basically feeling like we'd had the worst timing in the world to have missed the 60s. Like, how lame to have right. had all of that happen and be too young to have any part in it. Um, and my parents weren't hippies at all. I mean, we got there in 69 and they were very straight laced. And I feel like I saw hippies out the window um, of the car. You know, so there was such a sense of nostalgia. We were all trying to recreate that moment. I mean, I would walk around barefoot, you know, all day in San Fran in a city. Like, it seems that's, crazy I thought that's what now. you're supposed to do in San Francisco. <laughs> They haven't been doing that for a while. Um, anyway, I mean, my mother didn't love that, but it wasn't. It wasn't like. I, I mean, she didn't threaten to institutionalize me. But, you know, it was. It. It felt okay to be doing right. that. And then punk rock was such an overt repudiation of all of what of everything about the the sixties counterculture. Its music, its mood, its optimism, its sense of coherence. Phew, yeah. You know, Basically, it was just a big fuck you to all that, which in one way, you, you would think maybe that could have been disappointing or shocking, but I felt, and it, I felt that it was exciting. I still love the 60s stuff, but I love the idea that something new was on its way in. Yeah, I think it was a very exciting time. And, you know, um, I, I've 
was just happy to see sort of the mention of mention of like the dead Kennedys and Jello Biafra and, and you're, you know, I was like, oh, wow, I haven't seen that. You know, I used to see the, my brother used to come home with the vinyl and I would look He's at He's a kind of figure. legendary San Francisco figure. Yeah, he exactly. ran for mayor while I was living there. Um, and he's still out, he's still out and about. In fact, there's someone writing a book about him. Um, he was an interesting character. He yeah. was sort of a, in a way he was a kind of, um, host figure. He would, he would, you know, welcome bands from other cities. I mean, these scenes were so local. Um, he was, he was really kind of a, an eminence ultimately of the scene there. It's interesting. Um, you sort of mentioned a little bit, um, your, your sort of internal process, or I guess your external process of working with the manuscript. What about, and this is a kind of an abstract question, but can you, is there a way of describing your sort of, a, 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 the process of your imagination, like how you kind of come up with the ideas, how yeah. you manage them? and how you get them out on, on paper. Basically, in a way, it's fairly simple um, because it is so unconscious and intuitive. But what I really begin with is a time and a place. Ideally, I don't have too much more than that. Just I just need to know when and where. So for Goon Squad, it was very specific. I was actually I was trying to work on a different book, um, a historical novel that I'm really hoping to start very soon. Um, and, but I was having trouble kind of getting, I was having trouble getting back into the research that I had done. And I was in a hotel bathroom. I looked down, I saw a wallet under the sink as I was washing my hands. And I thought, oh my God, how could someone leave her bag with the wallet right there? I immediately, it immediately, I mean, I guess this is about as close as I get to my own experience. It connected instantly with experiences of my own of being robbed, which I have been a ridiculous number mm. of times and ways, not including physical violence. Um, but there was one particular time that was really um, tough when I was, my wallet was stolen and then I got a call from a, a Citibank employee who was very lovely and professional and said, you know, we have this service that will help you get your new card set up and, and sort of pull yourself out of this. And I was, I was very upset. This was probably 18 years ago and I, I cried on the phone and I said, I'm going out of town. I don't have any ID. What am I going to do? I sort of poured my story out to her and she said, you know, it'll all be fine. You know, it happens all the time. Um, then it came time to choose a new PIN number for my cash card, and somehow in the course of doing that, I, I somehow mentioned my old PIN number, and the conversation ended rather quickly at that point because she was the thief. Wow. <laughs> so she rushed to the nearest cash machine and overdrew my checking account, and I was just, I mean, I was flipping out before that. You can imagine the state yeah. I was in after I was like in orbit of misery, and I kept thinking, I, I talked to her. I talked to her on the phone. How you know? And but what I was left with when I, everything sort of calmed down, and of course the bank reimbursed me because they're re, they're insured for that. I kept thinking, what was it like from her side? Like who was she? I became fascinated. I, I wished that I could find her. Um, and so I think in this moment of looking at the wallet, I thought someone's going to take that. And then I thought, well, I'm the only one here. And then my mind sort of leapt into the, the, I guess, somehow touched on that old experience and my curiosity about the point of view opposing mine. Right. I know my own point of view. I know what it's like to have a wallet stolen. There's nothing interesting about that to me. But stealing it, that's interesting. So I thought, OK, I'm going to just for a break tomorrow, I'm going to start there. A woman sees a wallet and she takes it. And that's really all I knew. I didn't know who she was. I didn't know why she would take it what the context was. I just started there and started writing. And in the course of doing it, I, I learned that she was actually, she was taking the wallet, but also she was in her shrink's office later describing the experience of taking the wallet and what happened. I learned that she was on a date. All of these things kind of happened in the writing itself, but the, the, the doorway in was time, a time and a place. And that's pretty typical for me. It's interesting. And then you just managed, you sort of in your mind, you just managed those threads. Kind of, I mean, you had some, I think some of the stuff had been, you had some existing narratives out there, right? There was some, a, a four piece of the New Yorker. Were older. And, right. Well, no, the, your, the, the New Yorker, pub, they were all published as freestanding stories right. as I worked. Right. But, oh, I see. Okay, yeah. that was going to be my question. Basically, they weren't published ahead of time, and then you sort of made, did you have the novel in mind, the entire arc of the novel when you no. published them? In fact, I, I never really even thought of it as a novel, honestly. Right. Um, I had four chapters that were older that had been published in the 90s. And then I had this new stuff that seemed kind of exciting. I didn't really know how it would fit together. I think the other element that's important, so there's a time and a place, and then often there are some abstract questions floating around in my mind. Like with my novel, Look at Me, 
I had been thinking for a while, how, has ma how is mass media and image culture changing our, our inner lives, our sense of who we are to ourselves, or has it? So that's pretty abstract. You wouldn't necessarily think that would lead to any kind of fun fiction, but that coupled with some times and places evolved into a book. You know, with The Keep, I was interested in, you know, it, I was basically interested in how, if or how, our ubiquitous disembodied communication, because we're now in constant disembodied communication with each other, might mimic the gothic experience in which people are in remote places and there's this possibility of the supernatural all the time. Is there something supernatural about remote communication? I guess that was my question. And then, but then the time and the place were a guy arrives at a castle in a, an un, you yeah, know, unspecified that, European actually, yeah. country, you know, in roughly the present might day. Might be Czech Republic, might be Germany. Yeah, yeah, they're not even sure. They're not sure. Yeah. So with this one, I would say the abstract questions were, I, it really it was just one, which is, how, what would a contemporary novel about time look like? And the reason I was asking that question was that I had, I had finally read all of Proust's novel. It took me a while. I mean, I had, I had read a couple of volumes in my early 20s, loved all the obsessive, you know, obsessive love stuff, very bored by the time and the nostalgia. Right. Because um, in a way, in the early 20s, who cares? Um, but revisited it with a book group um, around in my late 30s when it all sort of <laughs> read a little differently. Um, and so we read the, the novel over about five years because, you know, we we're all doing other things. And actually, I think we had five children among us in those years. So we, it unfolded in a kind of real time. Our lives passed as the book unfolded. And, um, you know, I thought, I, I mean, it's, it's a book that's explicitly about time, mimics the effect of time passing. Um, it, it's just exquisite in its execution. And yet, of course, it's thousands of pages. And I thought... How could you do that and capture the feeling of time passing now in, an, in a more economical fashion, right. which feels more contemporary? So that was, I guess, the, that was the abstract question. The other thing is music plays a huge part in Proust's novel, both as a plot element and as an organizational principle. Um, I had wanted to write about the music industry as a journalist and begged and pleaded for an assignment <laughs> for years because I just wanted to learn about the industry. Um, I got I, as close, the closest I got was um, an assignment to write about a pair of identical twin rappers, uh, female, called Dime, D-Y-M-E, uh, in the late 90s. And their album was just about to come out, supposedly. So um, this led to my most embarrassing journalistic moment when at a party for a, a Biggie album release, I actually asked someone where Biggie was. Thus leading to the reply, he's dead, <laughs> which was a low point for me journalistically. <laughs> but anyway, these I love these. These were lovely women and very talented. But what I began to realize as I was following them was that their album actually wasn't going to be released. I could just mm -hmm. feel that it, the, it wasn't happening. And of course, the industry was in trouble by then. And I think you know, this, they were a casualty of that. As soon as I told my editor, I don't think the album is going to be released, of course, he said, well, you're off the story. St stop following them. And that was it. But a little of their DNA, I think, did end up in Goon Squad because I have a sister group yeah, called ben, Stop Go. Exactly. Who have an, or these, these women had an orange, uh, they lived with their parents and they had an orange shag um, carpeted uh, basement recording studio. studio. Right? Basement yeah. Studio. So I kind of, I, there was, I, I guess, in, I finally was able to use some, they were actually very talented, unlike the Stop Go sisters. But um, anyway, so time and music as abstract interests converged with this time and place, which was, you know, the present day. I think that one, at the beginning, I did not think I was writing a book, I should say that. I just thought I was writing some stories to kind of kill time, or not really that, amuse myself right. while I waited to begin this other book. And what kept happening was that I, I wrote the first one, and in the course of that, there's a brief mention of Sasha's boss, a record producer who uh, sprinkles gold flakes in his coffee right. and sprays pesticide in his armpits. And I thought at the time, oh, you know, decadent music producer, they have such crazy habits. But then after I finished it, I thought, yeah, but why does he do that stuff? Like, you know, that's just a stereotype, but there's always a, there's always a logic to it. You find out it. he has his reasons. Yeah, yeah, so I thought, 
I think I'm going to write a chapter about him <clears throat> and just find out why he does that stuff. So I wrote what became chapter two, and what, I, what was fun about it was that Sasha, the thief, is it takes place earlier in time, she's still his assistant, and she's this kind of opaque secondary character. And so I thought, oh, that was, I sort of liked that movement, you know, from that she had been so central, now she's peripheral. Um, it's at an earlier moment. And then there was a brief mention in that chapter of Benny's ex-wife, who's now a kind of avid doubles player at a country club. And I thought, yeah, but who, what is she like? I mean, she marries this music producer and then ends up a doubles player. What's that about? So I thought, okay, one more, and that is it. So I wrote a chapter about her, which comes later in the book. And in a, in a way, once I had written that one, I kind of realized I was hooked. But yeah. in terms of having a, an overall vision, I didn't, except to say, it, and this was kind of the analytical side of me, what is interesting or fun about this for me? And it seemed to me that there were three things that I wanted to keep doing as I moved through the material. One was that each chapter would be about a different person. Two was that each would be technically different from all of the others, so that they would not feel like one book. The, the, the voice, if you will, of each would be different, which is another way of saying that technically they would need to be different. Right. And then three was that each would stand on its own. And so those were my criteria. And I didn't, I didn't meet them every time. I mean, there was stuff I couldn't The third one is the toughest. Use. I think that's really, it's, it's, it's almost like a program. You know, I mean, to, to have each entity stand on its own, I mean, I think it, it works, but that seems it was hard. Very, very difficult. But yeah, you know what I found? I didn't have any close calls. It, the material either fit all of them or wildly missed on right. every count. So when they were bad, they were really, really bad. Um, it wasn't like two out of three, one out of three. It was always zero out of three or three out of three right. with a lot of work. Um, but there were some things I really slogged away on hoping that I could, I could make work and could not. And I, I never knew why. Hmm. <laughs> Um, but it, it seemed like it just had, it had to do with not being able to find a fresh angle or approach, not, not being able to find an interesting enough story about these people that would require telling in a different way. And so it had to go. You know? And did you, did you have to retool any of the previously published stuff, or was that pretty Very much? little. In fact, because it, it wasn't just a matter of sort of trying to work that stuff in. That stuff led the way with various okay. plot elements in, in the book. So it, once I realized that those four, which had no connection to each other at all, were all going to be part of this, it helped me form the landscape. Um, so yeah, so that was an odd, an, odd, an odd kind of organic whole that seemed to have been existing in, in pieces without my knowing it. Very interesting. Um, I wanted to, I, we should probably do Q&A in a couple of minutes. I just have a, one last question, because you're talking about Proust, and you have uh, sort of two chunks uh, as the, the epigraph, and one of them is, um, to, to quote Proust, um, the unknown element in the lives of other people is like that of nature, which each fresh scientific discovery merely reduces but does not abolish. Um, and I thought that was sort of, and this is my interpretation, was sort of this was now, we're now ta sort of talking about technology, no matter how connected we might seem to be, there's still that mystery of trying to understand how people work, the, how to get inside their minds. It's so interesting. Am I way off? Well, it, no, of course <laughs> not, because it's, you know, it's out of my hands, if that's what you saw there. I wasn't thinking of that consciously, although I am very interested in that. For example, with Look at Me, as I said before, I was interested in whether our inner lives, whether the kind of disappearance of privacy or the will toward self-revelation had changed the way we are kind of in our deepest parts. And I, the very fact that I was asking the question, I think, gives away the fact that I believe the answer was yes. Like, we're not the same anymore. We're, we're different humans than we used to be. But what I felt in the course of writing the book, I actually came to exactly the opposite conclusion, that there's just something in us that cannot be revealed. What, right. What's clear is that there is a on the part of many people as a, as a broader, you know, kind of a, a broader sensibility, a desire to reveal more. It, maybe even a desire to reveal everything, but it can't be done, I ended up feeling. You know, there's just something about us that can't be known. In that, in that what I was thinking of more was the, the, what I hoped would be kind of a fun aspect of the book, which was there are these people that you see from a distance, and then suddenly you're inside their own minds, that it, it was th this having a different protagonist in each chapter, I was hoping, I think, to mimic that experience of seeing someone out of the corner of your eye walking down the street and thinking, huh, where are they going? Who are they? 
of course, you rarely find out, but I love the idea of having that pay off 13 times. Yeah, that's exactly right. As the writer, of course, you know, you, you can go in there and create those. So, yeah, it was interesting. Um, I guess we should do Q&A. Um, if there are questions out there, you should come up to the microphones. Um, are there any? Yes. Hi. Um, I was wondering, since the process is so organic and took place over so much time, how do you know when it's done? That's a good question. I mean, in a certain sense, it never is. And like, ch there's a chapter I read aloud a lot where I have made a few improvements, I will confess. The text has deviated from the one that's printed. Um, so there's a way in which it's never done. I think, I think that um, I'm always trying to reach various milestones that allow me to move on in various ways. So there's the point where I'm just writing it on my own. Then I have this writing group, which is a very important part of my process. Um, I often will just bring things into them and say, is it alive? You know, is there even a pulse? Which is an important thing to find out. You know, I spent the, my very first attempt at writing a novel, I was in a vacuum for two years and I wrote just a completely dead object, which without a glimmer of interest or tension or anything. And I would prefer not to make that mistake again. So I try to get a sense of whether it, anything's happening at all. Um, and then as I work more on it, I, I tend to, I'll show the whole thing to various readers and each time revising. So with every one of those iterations, I'm sort of, I'm moving through a process. Then there's the point when the book is sold and then you do revisions and then there are, you know, two or three sets of page proofs and each time I'm making changes, ideally the changes are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. But there does come that last point where I know I'm, I'm basically signing off, and often I'll have a weird vertiginous sense of like, wait, that's all wrong. You know, right. it, it should all be changed, you know, and, but I can't. So it, it, there's a, I guess one moves closer and closer to a point when it's not possible to change it. Um, and yet it actually is still possible because then you have further additions and there are mistakes to be corrected. So the way I sometimes think of it is, it's two points that get closer and closer together, and of course the space between them can be subdivided infinitely, but they get close enough that they're practically touching, and then you have to stop. Thank you. I think that's an asymptote. <laughs> you have a line approaching, you want to get in cold. Okay. Hmm? <laughs> Hi. Uh, so first I think there's an interesting observation that you made about writing, which I think applies to a lot of software engineers here, uh, which is you know either getting it completely wrong or completely right. You know, there's in oh, between, that's interesting. You know, in between, you can't really do it. Huh. And also, uh, a lot of people here, right, they, uh, they use paper and whiteboards, right, to do ideas, right? You're at a computer all day, and that's how you actually push it out. But most of the thinking actually happens on, like, notepads and stuff like that. Is so, that right? Well, some people, but I that's think that's a big... Um, big so maybe that's you see the organic covered with You see whiteboards yeah. covered with all kinds Look of... Look around, yeah. yeah. Huh. Uh, and I guess the question I have is, so this book has like, you know, 50 characters or something like that. Um, so when you're writing, do you have some sort of, I guess, notepad where you keep track of all that you've said about them and what their relationships are and when they were introduced, that kind of thing? Or is, are you familiar enough with them all that they're all in your head, like real people? Or, I mean, how do you keep track of people? You know, it's a good question. I mean, I didn't, I had less backup than you would think for this. I, I didn't find it that hard to keep track of them. I had much more trouble with my novel Look at Me, which, believe it or not, is actually more complicated, <laughs> or somehow felt bigger, harder to hold in my brain um, than this one did. I did, the only thing that was challenging and that I really needed to hammer out were I, in other words, I knew all the things, but I, what I had to keep track of was when the reader knew them. And so, um, and especially, well, the, the ages of people was, was very tricky because I don't really nail down years overtly in the book, but I actually, there is a specific year when all of this stuff is happening. I just, especially with the technological element, I didn't want to get too hyper detailed about what, what was invented and used at what time. It can get a little fussy. Um, but just sort of what ages people were in relationship to each other and, you know, in relationship to the reader at various points. Um, the order of the chapters was something I struggled with enormously, which I think is worth mentioning here, because in terms of when readers know things, the order of the chapters is paramount. 
when I was working on it, I thought that the book would just go backwards because as I was writing the chapters, that's how they were emerging and it seemed really fun. And I thought, okay, so I mean, it's not like no one has done this before, but I thought, yeah, it's a reverse chronology. And rather soon I had problems with that because I knew I was going into the future. So then I thought, well, I can't like start with that. So I thought, okay, it goes backwards and then it leaps forward. And I kind of liked the shape of that. But one of the biggest disappointments actually happened when I read the book in that order, expecting a kind of combustion that I had hoped would take place all the way through. And it was very flat. It just wasn't there. And that was really disappointing. Um, and I thought, okay, so maybe this is just not going to work in the way I hoped. I mean, you know, writing books is always kind of like a chemistry experiment. You know, in the end, people tell you whether it's anything's happening or not, and you can kind of feel it too. So I thought maybe it just won't. But then I also thought, you know, this backwards chronology is really costing me a lot of opportunities for surprise and payoff for the reader. As one clear example. We, you mentioned that Benny is in, in the car um, in chapter two, reminiscing about his punk rock past. It's just a, it's just a paragraph, but you know, it, it sort of raises a question of like, huh, what was that like? Well, in my backwards chronology, we of course don't get to 1979 until like eight chapters later because I'm going backwards. So by that time, when we hit the punk rock scene in San Francisco, the reader has kind of forgotten about that moment of Benny reminiscing, and so there's no immediacy to the payoff and. I realized that that was totally wrong and that I needed to structure it much more intuitively and that in a way a backwards chronology is just as much of a straitjacket as a forward chronology. So that was when, when I understood that I was going to be moving around and that my only criteria really was going to, were going to be things like what would be the most fun to encounter now? <laughs> At that point, I, I started to be pretty systematic about what we already knew about people and what the ages they were when we last saw them because I didn't have that ramrod of a chronology to orient me. But even then, it was like a two-page document with a list of chapters and a few notes about each person. It wasn't like a spreadsheet or anything, partly because I don't know how to use spreadsheets. <laughs> Maybe that would have helped, next. actually. <laughs> Actually, that was the one thing in PowerPoint I had to get my sister, who was a consultant, to do the charts because I, I actually could not figure out how to well, use I was going to ask you, some of, them actually require, some of them require some data. There's some actual graphs in there. I, I provided the you. data and right. I said, make it beautiful. Right. <laughs> um, but I could not, I just, that was, the learning curve appeared to be too steep on that <laughs> one. Any other? So you said that uh, you wonder how a thief feels like, and then also you uh, also said that how does why does a music producer do all the weird things, and then uh, what fascinates me is what you said after that. You said that so I decided to write about them or write a story on them. So uh, what is the process that goes on within your mind, like when you try to understand people who you are not connected to? Like, it's very hard to understand people outside my domain. Like, I can't understand people who are in a different uh, place or a different profession. It's very hard. So what is the process? Is it just unconscious? Is it, is it an unconscious process that happens, like, when you write? Or do you go through a systematic process, like, of reading about them and trying to understand them? Or what is the process uh, that you have in your mind or in your habits, like how do you do that? It's it's, it's, it's a great hard question. To do it. yeah. yeah, you know, I it's for me it is it is the hard thing is exactly the opposite. What I do, what I am worst at as a writer is writing about myself. I hate it. I find it dull, and I and also I kind of freeze up. I don't want to give anything away, and that's no good as a fiction writer. So for me, it is totally intuitive. I just let it roll and see what happens. I, I guess I just make it up, although that sounds, um, I don't know, somehow that sounds presumptuous, but I guess in a way <laughs> writing fiction is pretty presumptuous. Um, I find it easiest with people who are farthest from my own life. So for example, I, I love, I find it comfortable, I should say, to write about men because there's a kind of easy way to separate myself from them. Now, it's not that I'm some great expert on men, or I, I mean, I really am not. Like, I, I, didn't, I didn't grow up in a, in a family with a lot of brothers. I have no particular insight into men, but I just, I, I, I don't know. It's funny. I, I, it's hard for me to 
come up with a, an articulate answer except to say I, I start writing and I see what happens. And if it feels interesting, then I, I roll with it. And maybe that means we're just all more alike than we think, but I don't even know. I, I, I'm not sure. One important component of feeling that a character is working is a sense that I can hear them. Like just having a sense of how people talk, which again, I experience as rather passively. I feel as if I'm kind of taking dictation. Now, obviously on some level, I'm also inventing it, but my experience of it is one of being entertained by a conversation that seems to be just falling out organically. It's not that I, I mean, I've had characters that I really struggled with. One in Goon Squad that I, I probably struggled with the most, two of them. There's a guy named Lou who does a lot of really bad things, and I didn't feel like I was struggling with, with him, but I struggled to find, make, I, I, I had to work to make the logic of his inner life available to readers so they weren't just horrified by him, although some still are. Um, and, but there was a character named Rob in a chapter called Out of Body, and he's telling his story in the second person. He was someone I really struggled with. I was just finding it hard to feel the totality of this guy, his voice, the way he looked, his experience. It wasn't coming together, and yet I really felt convinced that it could and had to. Um, this was, I think, the last chapter I wrote. Very hard. You know, I, I, so, I had so many options that weren't open to me anymore, having written 12 at that, or 13, 11 other chapters, um, the PowerPoint I wrote after this. But anyway, a crucial moment in the, in the crystallization of Rob in my mind happened on the subway when I was sitting there on a crowded subway and I heard this guy talking. I think he was talking about going skiing. And just his voice reminded me a lot of guys I'd grown up with in San Francisco in the 70s. Um, he just, I don't know, he had a kind of deep voice. Um, and I, I stood up to look at him and see what he looked like. And he had a kind of reddish stubble. He was sort of a, a big, strong guy. And my Rob had been very slender and sort of feminine. But the minute I saw this guy, I thought, that's him. I, the face, the voice, the stubble. I was, I was done. I knew that I, I, I had him. And so at that point, after that, I started writing with that image in mind of Rob. And in fact, his physicality is a really important part of who he is. It turns out he's a football, a former football player. Um, you know, there's a kind of, his bigness is a part of him in every moment of that chapter. And without that bigness, I couldn't make him work. But again, the closest I, I can seem to come to actually using anyone from my life is literally grabbing images of strangers on the subway. So it's an odd, it's an odd process. Where I have the most trouble, it won't surprise you to hear after all that I've said, is like writing about someone who really reminds me of someone that I, I know, which I did in Look at Me, a very problematic character because I, you know, he has a, there's a connection to someone I know and love, and the result was that I gave this person way too much airtime, and people were just numb with boredom because they thought, like, he never shuts up. Why, <laughs> you're, you're, are you not seeing or hearing how dull this is? And I was not. I felt like it was fascinating. So that's an example of how my judgment seems to really be impaired by actual connections to my real life. The distance helps. It really Great helps, distance, yeah. yeah. Clear boundaries yeah. seem to really help me. That being said, actually, the narrator of the PowerPoint, I think, is a lot like me, the 12-year-old. I, I kind of missed it because I was under so much pressure to write that chapter quickly, and I was so thrilled to have found a way to do it at all that I think I, I sort of sneaked in there without even realizing it. But the kind of peacemaking preteen who's kind of a storyteller and a witness, you know, I think there's, there's a connection there. But I didn't know it, and that's, that was what was important. Um, I just not, I need to not know it until it's already done. <laughs> Great. Thank you. I think we're probably out of time. Um, so thanks so much. Thank thanks you for very having me. Happy to sign books if you want.